Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the National Atomic Testing Museum's Distinguished Lecture featuring Dr. Victor Reese. It's wonderful to have you all here this evening. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your Thursday to, to be with us. So we are very excited to have Dr. Reese here. Um, now, I'll tell you a little bit of background on him, and then I'll uh, hand it over to him. And, um, and also at the, the end, we will have a couple questions from the museum, and then we'll also open it up to uh, the attendees of you uh, who are interested in asking some questions. We'll also be telling you a little bit about our next uh, lecture, which is on October 8th. So Dr. Victor H. Reese uh, retired on March 1st, 2017 as Senior Advisor, U.S. Department of Energy, where he worked on national security and nuclear energy issues for the Secretary of Energy and the Undersecretaries of Energy for National Security and Science since 2005. He is currently writing a memoir tentatively titled Eisenhower, Feynman, and the Four Prunes, Systems, Strategies, and Dangerous Scientific and Technological Elite. He led the development of the DOE's science-based stockpiled stewardship program when he was Assistant Secretary for Defense Programs in the U.S. Department of Energy from 1993 to 1999. His past government appointments include serving as Director of Defense Research and Engineering in the Defense Department, Director of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, Agency or DARPA, and Assistant Director for National Security and Space, Office of Science and Technology Policy, the Executive Office of the President and a research engineer at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Ames Research Center. He was Senior Vice President for Strat Strategic Planning at SAIC, Senior Staff Member at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and has held other industrial research and management positions. He has chaired and served on numerous government and laboratory advisory committees and boards for the DOD, CIA, and uh, NASA, U.S. Strategic Command, NNSA, U.S. Navy, and Los Alamos, Sandia, and Argonne, and Idaho National Laboratories. Dr. Reese earned a BME in Mechanical Engineering from the Rensel Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and a uh, Master's in Engineering in Mechanical Engineering from Yale University, and an MA and PhD from Princeton University. He has authored numerous scientific and policy publications, and his awards include two Department of Defense Distinguished Public Service Medals, the Department of Energy, James R. Schlesinger Award, the John S. Foster Jr. Medal, and an honorary medal from the French, At French Atomic Energy Commission. So it is my pleasure to introduce all of you to Dr. Victor H. Reese. Thank you so much for coming. Okay, 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 there I am. So far, so good. Okay, so let me share the screen. And share. Okay, so yes. So far, that's uh, should be doing better. There we go. Uh oh, let's go back one. Okay. So this is the uh, this is the a strategy for U.S. nuclear power mitigating climate change, and I'm doing this on uh, Zoom uh, to all of you. That's me. Uh, and I'm, I assume you're out there, though I have no way of telling. Uh, but the important part about uh, the title, it's a strategy. It's not necessarily the strategy. It is a strategy. And I'd certainly like to thank the Atomic uh, Testing Museum for giving me an opportunity to uh, try this out and see, uh, see what people think about it. Uh, now, the, as I say, this is a strategy. The Department of Energy recently put together a strategy uh, for nuclear energy, um, but this was somewhat different. This was, again, a strategy to assure uh, national security. Uh, it was uh, 
uh, put together under the direction of uh, Dr. Rita, uh, Rita Barnwall, who's head of the nuclear, nuclear energy uh, group and the Department of Energy, and it's a good strategy. Uh, it, uh, it has a goal, which is important for a strategy, tells you what it wants to do, and then it builds the program around that. Uh, but it doesn't include uh, almost uh, climate change. So I thought, well, I'll give it a try and put together my strategy uh, for climate change, mitigating climate change, how nuclear uh, can work with that. And I should point out that uh, that just represents me. And I tried an uh, example on a few folks, but basically this is uh, this is me, uh, Google, uh, what I know, and uh, PowerPoint. So we'll give that a try. Uh, but it is a strategy. Uh, so let me start then with climate change. Uh, and I'll, these are the observations. And any any uh, our, uh, lecture or discussion of climate change, I think, should start with uh, the Keeling curve, which is showing here. It's really quite interesting. Uh, uh, that's uh, Charles Keeling. Uh, back in uh, the late 50s, he thought uh, uh, he'd go try to get uh, uh, measure the atmospheric CO, CO2, and they've been making those measurements, uh, well, now it's uh, uh, for almost uh, 60 years. And what you see, of course, is that the atmosphere of CO2, which is a, a greenhouse gas, keeps going up and up and up. Uh, the next thing you know, and uh, by the way, the, say the problem with that, of course, CO2 is not just a greenhouse gas, but it stays in the atmosphere for something like 300 to 1,000 a, a years. Well, the next problem, of course, is that we notice the temperature, uh, the average temperature based on some serious measurement has also been going up. It's now almost a, a, a degree centigrade. Uh, so the two are obviously uh, not just correlated, but one uh, depends on the, pretty much uh, depends on the, the temperature, again, depends on this greenhouse gas. Uh, and as a result is we're facing a global problem. Uh, some people think, in fact, it's a, an existential problem over, over time. Oh, well, how, well what, uh, how do we predict? That's the next step. And here's a set of predictions uh, with a group, uh, the World Climate Research Program. Uh, one of the things they're working on is a, there's a group actually uh, up at uh, uh, Livermore, which uh, gives them problems, gives the various uh, uh, groups around the world problems. They all calculate it, uh, given an emissions, uh, a different number of CO2 emissions. Uh, as you can see, there's a fair amount of consensus in terms of all the, all the predictions that one makes. Well, so the temperature may be going up as much as five degrees or even uh, close to one and a half or two degrees, depending upon how much, how much CO2 is emitted. Uh, what's the consequence of that? Well, there's a lot of consequences. There's a fair amount of controversy, but the most obvious thing, at least to me, is the uh, possible the, the sea rising. Uh, and then if you look at within the US at least, where is the vulnerability uh, to sea rises? Come uh, places again like uh, New Orleans, uh, Miami and so forth, they're very susceptible to that. Uh, here's a little photograph even recently from uh, Virginia Beach where people say, listen, this is really new and really interesting. Okay, so that's, uh, that's you can pretty much convince that I think, but uh, that climate change A is real and really pretty dangerous. Uh, what's the role of the, the US in this? Uh, well, uh, here's uh, data from the US uh, Energy Information Administration. And in general, speaking throughout this, I'll be using the US uh, EIA as the source of basically the source of data. So this is the annual CO2 emissions from fossil fuels. Uh, you can see the US is uh, beginning actually to get a little bit lower. There's about 40 billion metric tons that are being uh, something under that, are being emitted as of 
2017, the U.S. has about 4 billion tons. Uh, not an insignificant amount, but uh, certainly uh, uh, there's a lot more around the West, rest of the world. So you ask yourself, what is the role of the United States in this? And I would argue, I will argue, that our, um, that the, the uh, in this whole idea of, of perhaps mitigating global CO2, it's uh, the leadership, technical, political, policy leadership in reducing CO2. Uh, and in fact, I will argue uh, and finish up in the sense that, that this is not unlike uh, President Eisenhower in terms of doing the atoms, getting the atoms for peace started. Uh, that was back in back in 1954. Okay, so uh, okay, so uh, what about the electricity sector? Since that's what I'll be talking about again. This is the U.S. Uh, EIA annual energy outlook and they give projections what they think it will be until uh, 2015 this was how things were in uh, uh, in the US uh, co2 was again about uh, four four thousand a million tons of co2 is emitted uh, of which 1700 million tons are in the electricity sector. Mm -hmm. So people again will, will say, wait, well, you know, over time the electricity sector might in fact be growing. This is their estimate as to projections and how they get these uh, estimates from very complicated, very complex uh, uh, analyses and uh, simulations and so forth. Uh, they, this is their reference case. They, which they that says there's no policy changes. That means that whatever policy we have now in the U.S. Uh, driven by the states and various regions and so forth, and the it's mostly mostly then they they assume that the the system will then choose the economic will make decisions on the basis of economics. Uh, and you know, what you see is the natural gas renewables, nuclear, uh, coal, uh, and the big rise is primarily in uh, in uh, uh, renewables, which is like 19, again, 19 percent now moves up to 38 uh, percent. Coal drops off. Uh, where is the carbon coming from? Uh, it's at 970 million tons uh, from uh, CO2 from uh, natural gas, 700 million tons from coal. So far, this is just, again, data. And at this point, I'm um, now saying, okay, now given that is the data, uh, what is the strategy? And my strategy, again, this is simply me. Uh, I'm saying, look, uh, let's maintain the, and extend the life of the current reactors, uh, which is, again, I'm part of the national strategy. But let me say in the goal, I'm saying starting in 2030, 10 years, install and operate small modular reactors at about five gigawatts a year to replace coal. Coal is where the carbon dioxide is, and that's what we're after. That's a, a lot. Uh, five gigawatts is again uh, 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 quite a bit. But if one looks at again, there's there's that's what the strategy uh, would look like as a goal. Uh, that, that sounds like a lot of a lot of uh, small modular reactors, uh, a lot of building. But in fact, uh, it's it is certainly a lot. But it's pretty much like we did between 1970 and 1970 uh, and uh, 1990. We, we increased the amount of nuclear power by about five gigawatt years. Different time, different, uh, different uh, level of technology, but uh, different type of technology. But nonetheless, uh, it's, uh, while it's a lot, it's not unprecedented. Okay, so what is the strategy? If I want to replace coal, that's the goal by 2050. 
I'm saying, hey, and I'm need, gonna need a lot. Uh, so I'm saying, let me take those things that work well now uh, and scale in time to meet a goal, to meet the goal. So no new, uh, no inventions, uh, no new organizations. I'm gonna try to see if I can put a strategy together that works with what we know we have available now in this, in this country. And the key, of course, is we start not with, uh, we start with it in the end. Uh, new scale, new scale power, the, the SMR design, which fortunately, for, not just for my talk, but fortunately it was just recently approved by the NRC. So I'm dealing with a, a proven or an, an approved an approved design. Um, I have to manufacture a lot of them. Uh, as we saw, we we're talking at, uh, uh, and I'm saying, well, maybe in a new scale in and of itself can't produce as many as I need. So I'm saying, well, they're already working with uh, BWXT, but other US companies like General Dynamics, uh, uh, Lockheed Martin has indicated some interest, so the the they in turn will help. Will other industry will be able to help them work, uh, and indeed uh, then construct construct the plants. There are a lot of plants that need to be constructed, and again in the U.S., Bechtel Fluor, which already was working with New Scale, um, uh, Kiewit, the other there's a number of other companies can do that. Uh, and then indeed, they that they turn to the current U.S. operators that are generating electricity on on the grid. They re really do a marvelous job. Uh, capacity factors are well over at ninety percent, and so uh, there's no doubt that any one of these uh, operators can uh, can take the uh, operate that those type of reactors successfully. Uh, what do I do with the uh, what do I do with the uh, spent fuel? Uh, I put that into, put them all into dry, uh, uh, dry cask storage. Uh, how do I then run all this? I'm saying, well, I've got one of the best management organizations in the world within the Department of Energy. Uh, and I let, let the Department of Energy, the Naval Reactors, uh, manage this whole thing. Uh, and then, why do I fund it? I'm saying all of this is essentially funded by the federal mm -hmm. government. So that's the strategy. Um, and, I'm, uh, and I'll go through that then piece by piece. But essentially, that's the strategy. Again, every one of those things uh, is, a, is a pretty much demonstrated operating. Mm -hmm. Now it's a question of how, do you, how can you put it together? Uh, uh, this is the small light water small modular reactor of new scale. Uh, it's, uh, its basic module is uh, 60 uh, megawatts uh, and they can be put together in a variety of ways. The sort of uh, top end would be uh, 12 of these into 720 uh, megawatts. Uh, getting close, getting not too far from it sort of standard uh, U.S. gigawatt. Uh, this is uh, Jose Reyes, who gets a lot of credit for this. Uh, in fairness, I, I, I did show this uh, with, with, uh, to the New Scale folks, uh, and uh, Jose said I had a, an old picture of him. So this is the latest picture of Jose. Uh, and what, what he did, really quite remarkable uh, a number of years ago, starting I think when he was getting out of graduate, graduate school uh, in nuclear engineering, he sort of gave himself the task of designing a super ultra really safe reactor. How would you basically do that? And that's what's been developed over time by the new, uh, became the New Scale Corporation, you sort of screw out of uh, Oregon State, uh, mm -hmm. and it uh, really is ultra safe, a lot of characteristics, but primarily it's pass, completely passive, uh, so almost sort of walk away safe. 
uh, no pumps, all done by natural collection. It uses standard uh, LEU, mm -hmm. uh, low enriched uranium fuel, um, so uh, no advances in fuel are necessary. Again, modular design. Uh, it's made primarily, or well, certainly the modules are all done in a factory and then just assembled uh, out in the field. Uh, and uh, I've learned that this is, as I prepared this uh, briefing, uh, this whole idea of load following uh, and how it works uh, is, is really quite uh, important. Uh, and again, this, the, the safety design of this was approved not too long ago, this last August, uh, and then 2020. A big, a big step forward because they, NRC really puts you through a, uh, a very, very detailed uh, process. Uh, Jose told me the cost estimate for the nth of a kind is about $3,600 a, a kilowatt. That's their estimate. Um, seems perfectly reasonable. Uh, but as in five gigawatts per year, you're talking about building 80, 80 reactors, uh, 80 of these modules every year. That's quite a bit. Okay. Uh, spent fuel storage. Well, I say I'm using a dry cast storage. It's in wide use. Uh, it's uh, licensed uh, and it is uh, affordable. And as you can see, various it's various types of estimates. It's all, it's already being used all over the country. Again, these are independent spent fuel stories uh, installations mm -hmm. in which that is what I'd recommend. Holtec also is proposing a new one here in Carlsbad, uh, actually under underground. Uh, uh, in the long term, I'm saying let's move geological storage to the long, long term. It's not part, not necessarily part of this. Uh, but indeed, we already have doing this uh, in terms of the geological story in the waste isolation pilot plant, which works in the salt deposits in the in the southwest. And at least locally, they have a, a strong public support for that. Uh, what do you do about Yucca Mountain? Uh, you press the button, and it uh, it just goes away. Uh, Okay, so this is something that, uh, wh where do you put the, where does this, it's, it's the, it, the, this is something that was really, um, I was not really up to speed on this, and so pre preparing really for this talk, I started reading, I read three or four books, a number of articles about the grid, and it's the grid uh, that you really have to think about here. Uh, this is the number of generators uh, in the U.S., as you can see, they're all different kinds. They're all over the place. They're all different sizes. They're all part of the grid. This is the transmission lines, uh, again, uh, uh, from uh, different uh, uh, high voltage uh, transmission lines. There's even a couple of DC lines. Most of them are, almost all of them are AC lines as well. Um, there is, uh, in late 2017, over 3,000, three, well, there's 3,371 providers, a lot of customers, a lot of kilowatt hours, and a lot of money. This is a big, big deal, uh, but the, and it uh, makes it even more complicated. Uh, there are publicly owned utilities, investor-owned utilities, cooperatives, any type of organization, federal power, a uh, number of people are not even, you know, do it themselves. Uh, they're not on, they're not utilities, but they're part of the grid and there, there are people who just market this stuff, the whole market is uh, without, so they're the providers of the electricity. Uh, just, and then in addition to which, there's all sorts of uh, organizations that are involved with this. Uh, this is a report by that MIT put together and all I did was go in the back of the report where they have a list of acronyms uh, these are the organizations that are all involved in this, uh, in dealing with the grid to say nothing of the, the, the 50 states plus the District of Columbia all have their own uh, commission. So it's a hodgepodge. Uh, and uh, in fact, you might say it's a modern miracle that this thing uh, works at all. 
uh, again, uh, most recently, uh, just uh, past month or so, uh, there's a national commission on grid resilience, uh, which was working sometime over the past year or so. Uh, and it was put together for pri grid resilience priorities for the next administration. Uh, those were the commissioners. Uh, some very familiar names, uh, but if you look at them, you'll notice there's uh, two generals, a congressman, uh, a couple of lawyers, and a journalist. Uh, and one, yes, Norm Morgan, a great engineer, but only one, one engineer. And because there's so much uh, legal, military, and so forth. And this is a statement that they, they're making. I think it's important. They say our um, electricity's grid resilience, uh, which means how do you ability to stand shocks, both from national events, blackouts, things like that, cyber attack, EMP, and, and just uh, has merged as a major concern for national security and stable civilian society. And as part of what they've done, they actually recommended small modular de development. And then again, they showed the new scale uh, the new scale as an, not just an example, but specifically as part of a, um, uh, part of a resilient, if you will, a microgrid. Um, and it suggested that they, they, they give a test of the new scale result as part of a, a part of a, a design of some, some test beds as well. So that's important. Well, then the question becomes, hmm, how do you integrate, in this case, what's uh, the solar and wind, which is usually called in jargon, variable renewable energy, which you don't, you know, uh, and uh, into the grid, because if you recall, there's gonna be a lot of it. This is again from the same report, uh, wind, um, uh, the, the parts that actually variable, in terms of the renewable stuff is the wind and solar. So it's a lot, uh, you know, over like 1,700 billion, uh, uh, million kilowatt hours, uh, scale might be right there, uh, doing that. Well, to get a sense of that, I uh, read a book. Sometimes, you know, when all else fails, read a book. Uh, this is a book about uh, the future of uh, solar energy by a uh, um, uh, Stanford uh, uh, working on the Stanford in the West Coast, uh, and uh, and I recommend it. And what he is, do what he says in doing this is that if we're really going to use this, uh, you you're just concentrating on solar. Uh, there's going to be, there's going to have to be some innovations. And he suggested one thing that they were going to need some innovations in how to finance this stuff. Uh, he's suggesting that, you know, we bundle, bundle all the little entrepreneurs and uh, securitize them. That was, of course, exactly what we did with the, uh, with the housing crisis. Didn't work all that well for them, but he says maybe you could try it again. Uh, silicon technology, he thinks, is being the, the silicon panels. Uh, he said they're about as far as they can go, and he's suggesting that other types of technology would be necessary. But when he gets, he said, this is really the big one, is how do you integrate this, these variable uh, renewable energy, the solar wind, into the grid? Uh, because there, uh, in fact, he makes the statement that the penetration uh, of the VRM is probably limited to about 25% of the grid because it becomes unstable. Uh, the, the types of thing, the types of generators like nuclear, which includes SMRs and, uh, and the fossil fuels and so forth are uh, stable because you know what you're you generating as much electricity as you as you need uh, you're not dependent on the randomness of wind or or sun so this stability becomes a big point and this is a I started looking into this there's a paper that I found a, 
this paper. It's also on the website of uh, New Scale, and uh, where they used a, they got actual data from a horse butte in Idaho. That's a, a wind farm, and as you can see, that's in, uh, uh, you know, that's in the blue, and that shows the actual data. And then they sort of, well, if I had a module of New Scale, they can simulate that to to match a to match a, a, a demand curve that, that would show up. Um, you can also, and again, do the, the, this is a sort of tr a problem with solar. Not only does it, it fluctuate, but uh, just, it, you know, sun goes down, uh, you don't get any solar, and that, that you, you end up, you plot if you will, where the generation is, and you discover, yes, gee, you don't need that much. Just when you're getting the, the most uh, electricity from the solar, uh, which is sort of midday, um, um, you may get more than you actually need. And then uh, as evening shows up, it goes, and the solar goes away, and that's when the demand comes up. And so you get a significant ramp required, which uh, in general is done by uh, gas, uh, combustion gas turbines. And uh, the folks from, there's no reason why that can't be handled with, uh, with modules, uh, or reactor, reactors. Okay, so uh, the, the, the problem, uh, and the, the, the paper ends with a statement saying, hey, we can do load following the power plant, minimize the need for fossil-based peaking power while allowing for greater penetration of renewable resources. And so what I'm suggesting, uh, and again, uh, there's no analysis that goes along with this, that you can you have a mix of stable, and the reason they're stable is that you've got all this spinning inertia in, in the small modular reactors uh, and un, basically unstable, flexible, uh, but they're inexpensive, uh, wind and solar. Can you be scaled to the entire grid? Uh, the work that has been done so far sort of takes one or two modules and compares it with one or two, uh, one or two wind farms or, or solar plants. Well, what can you scale that to the entire Grid, put the basically two, put the two together. I have no idea, but I'm saying I would believe that's requires a would be quite a large, large scale grids trying to simulate not just a piece of the grid, but much of the grid. And that work is starting at the DOE laboratories, uh, and I'm going. And I'm suggesting that right now that they begin to take a look at. What would happen when you're talking about putting, say, uh, uh, not just one or two small modular reactors, but literally hundreds of modular reactors on the grid? In that way, you're keeping the grid viable for a longer, much longer time, which is consistent with my goals of what I'm talking about. Well, the only part left now is the naval reactors, and I'm suggesting they should manage the program. I didn't ask them, I haven't talked to them about it, but this is my suggestion. Well, that, that really is, of course, uh, uh, goes back to Admiral Hyman Rickover. He was the father of all, he genuinely was the father of all of this, as you know, he put the Nautilus together back in 19, uh, 1955, but he also did the first shipping port uh, was one of the first reactors in this uh, country, which was essentially a naval reactor put on uh, put on land. It operated for uh, some, some basically some thirty years. Uh, this is where we are now. The, 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 this is truly a remarkable, uh, remarkable organization. A remarkable record. They they built a, as I say five a well over five hundred cores. They've had sixty. 200 accident-free reactor years, and as of 2017, there were 92 reactors out. Uh, what was interesting about shipping port 
they, they didn't work anymore, but the actual design of the system, the pressurized water reactor, mm -hmm. uh, which dominates the design, or not just the US around mm -hmm. the world, and again, is also on a new scale. Uh, that all comes from, uh, from the Navy. In fact, the Navy also built one reactor that did not need pumps. Uh, the USS Narwhal, and was quite a successful. So the basic idea of a passive passive reactor uh, has been operated again. All of this flows into into the uh, comes from uh, comes from Rickover and maintained in that organization. Well, the next that was okay. I, I got all this, but this this job of climate change mitigation. Who's responsible for making that happen? Uh, this is a picture of John Rowe, and who I got to know reasonably well. Uh, he was the CEO of Exelon. He was president of the American Nuclear Society, and he gave a talk uh, at one of the one of the meetings where he quoted saying, "Nuclear is a business, not a religion." Uh, why Roe, while uh, what Roe is interesting, of course, uh, the, the company that Exxon uh, grew from was, among others, uh, Common, uh, Commonwealth Edison, uh, whose uh, CEO, founder, chairman was Samuel Insull, who was, in fact, the one who put the grid together, starting from that. He's the one who said, we really need a grid. He set up almost the entire system with of government regulated and so forth. And while he's sort of, in many respects, forgotten today, uh, but he started his career as the secretary of, of Thomas Edison. Uh, quite an interesting heritage. But uh, the, the, if you go back and say, well, why aren't you worrying about this? And look, the mission of of Exxon is to deliver like and other electric uh, utility uh, which is, uh, companies are, are to deliver electricity to the grid safely and reliably and at a reasonable cost uh, and a re reasonable return to their investors uh, or whoever. Um, climate change is simply not their business. Uh, I, I gave that I was giving in a, in a meeting, uh, and I mentioned the John Rowe uh, quote about nuclear is a business, not a religion. And in the audience was another associate of mine. In the audience was a member of the group, it was Admiral Bruce de Mars. And he said, nuclear is a religion. He was also on the Exxon Board of Directors at the time, and he, he was not the immediate successor uh, to Rick Over, but he was one, he was head of the nuclear reactors uh, uh, once removed. He was like the third one. Uh, and what he meant by religion is this real uh, dedication, again, like a religion to safety. And as you can, you can see, this, is, this has really worked. But their mission in naval reactors is to power submarines and aircraft carriers, which are really central to our national security. And climate change is not mitigation, really is not their business. Well, how do you pull this together? I'm saying mitigating climate change is a government responsibility. And because it's a government responsibility, uh, and how important is that? Well, I was discussing that, oh, several months ago with uh, Matt Wall to the Nuclear Energy Institute. And this, he says, what you're talking about is similar to what happened in World War II. Uh, in the, so the arsenal of democracy where you have to build a lot, a lot of stuff and you have to build it fast. This wasn't energy, but this was bombers. Uh, and they had a really a you know good design. They built one or two from consolidated a few from consolidated aircraft, but they had to build a lot, and they had to build them fast. And the uh, uh, they went to in this case Ford. Ford had some experience with the Ford trimotor, 
Uh, the person I'm showing is Charles uh, Sorensen. He was the sort of head of Ford at the time. And they started right from scratch building a plant to be able to build you know, at Willow Run. And you notice that's just a few months later, they, they started building the plant and they turned these out and they turned it enormously so that when uh, uh, the, one of the first major raids uh, from the U.S., uh, this was some Palesti, uh, Romanian uh, oil fields. There were like set 100, almost 200 B-24s already in just a year and a half. Uh, was, um, just two years later. So it's really quite a remarkable system when you need a lot fast, but it isn't necessarily the, the you have to have the design, you have to be able to build something, but you have to have that manufacturing capability. So the, 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 what I'm suggesting is that if you're really serious about climate change mitigation, what you need is an arsenal of nuclear climate change, mm -hmm. U.S. arsenal mm -hmm. as well. Well, the only thing, again, every one of these organizations exists. They're, they're certainly very, very capable. Uh, what might this cost? Uh, and, well, I'm suggesting that you, uh, what you need is the government to fund this. And there are a number of possibilities of doing that. Uh, and we're doing some of this, much of this already R&D sharing. Uh, we're already sharing with new scale 50-50 uh, investment production tax crops, um, sorry, credits, uh, feed in tariffs. There's a number of uh, what's called re uh, renewable portfolio standards. Instead of just renewable, make them clean standards. A number of the states are already saying these have to be done. So, but it's a it's a uh, kind of a hodgepodge of various things. I'm saying, hey, suppose the government fully funds small modular reactor, not just the R and D, but the manufacture, the construction, essentially make a small modular reactors government furnished equipment for the uh, that are that are the plants are are built away and the operators just take them over and generate electricity. What would that cost? Well you remember new scale estimated thirty six hundred dollars a kilowatt um, five kilowatt gigawatts a year eighteen that's eighteen billion dollars a year over twenty billion dollars that's three hundred and sixty billion dollars. Uh, that's not chicken feed. Uh, that's quite a bit of money, and of course, in doing the analysis, doing this analysis, this is just a simple analysis. Uh, all the hard stuff in terms of what that is, uh, in terms of trying to do this analysis, I've ignored. But this gives you a sense of what we're talking about. Uh, Eighteen billion dollars is more than ten times. I, I would imagine that a nuclear energy, the DOE nuclear energy sp spends uh, every year. Uh, on this, uh, so it's a big, it's a big amount of money. Uh, on the other hand, why are we doing this? Well, we're doing this not to generate, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, make money for the uh, electric companies or sell electricity. We're trying to avoid CO2. Well, we've avoided in the 20 years we've been avoided about seven billion metric tons of of uh, CO2. Uh, if you look at, well, how much is that worth? Well, there's been a number of analyses done in terms of uh, uh, things like a carbon tax. I'm showing that you go to the bipartisan climate roadmap. Uh, a typical starting number is, um, well, I'm saying for the number here, you just divide seven, you know, it's about $50 a ton. And that's fairly typical of what a what a carbon tax is. And so I'm suggesting that's the appropriate dollars that you should be basically thinking of. Of course, in the meantime, for the SMRs, if we sold that amount, why we'd be selling uh, about four, you know, uh, $400 billion. We get a, it's a price of electricity is about 15 cents, 10, 15 cents a kilowatt hour, I'm saying. Five cents a kilowatt hour would go back to electricity. So, okay. So, uh, what th this essentially does is this. Uh, let me summarize. What I'm saying is that an aggressive, this is certainly aggressive, U.S. nuclear strategy 
based on an NRC approved design, dry cast storage, current organizations, uh, and a lot of US funding, no question about that, to help mitigate uh, time urgent climate change by replacing coal plants. All I'm saying is it's feasible, I'm not even saying it's plausible, but you put the numbers. And indeed, I think the uncertainty is it may even be, uh, I suspect it is, uh, helpful in wind and solar making, uh, increasing the significant levels of penetration. Uh, in a sense, what I'm saying is uh, we're uh, uh, trying to integrate all these basically things, put a lot of money into it, and it's not just a Green New Deal, it's a Green New Nuclear Deal. And uh, so I'm suggesting what the only thing that's really missing from all of this uh, is the US uh, and from the federal government basically leadership and there I, I always like to end talks and generally with Eisenhower's discussion and it's uh, uh, for Adams for Peace where it's uh, uh, and he ends his talk with making these fateful decisions the US United States pledges before you and therefore before the world its determination to help solve a fearful atomic dilemma to devote its entire heart and mind to find the way by which the miraculous inventiveness of man shall not be dedicated to his death but concentrated to his life I would just do the same thing but change that to uh, climate change and uh, with that I want to thank the people from the atomic uh, energy uh, National Atomic Energy Museum for giving me this opportunity and for all the people that are, uh, I, I'm sure this is what's happening uh, in, in their individual places or if we were talking with a great group of people. Okay, so that basically does it. Okay, so let me now, I'm supposed to stop my video, right? And uh, there we are. Okay. Can I, um, Dr. Reese, you can turn your video back on. I'm just going to um, okay. ask you a couple questions and then we'll open it up to uh, the chat. If you have any questions, those in attendance, uh, please put it in either the Q&A or chat um, options down below. Um, and we'll follow along and we'll double check. Um, and so just a, a couple questions from us here at the staff. And first of all, First of all, great talk. Thank you so much. It's, it's a solid plan based on what you're putting forward. So um, we're really glad that you could share that with us tonight. Uh, but a couple of questions that we had. Um, do you have any concerns over how the general public would react to an increase in nuclear power? Yeah, I, you know, uh, this, is, um, this is certainly not easy. Uh, before Fukushima, uh, you know, uh, there was actually a change over time in terms of doing this. I think it has to be done uh, in terms of the climate change. If you're not concerned about climate change, uh, then you probably don't need nuclear, you know, and if you're afraid of nuclear power, that would, you know, that would, uh, you, you're stuck. Okay, I think that's really it's a leadership issue. It's how it's how it's handled by the basically by it's handled by the leadership. Uh, you know, um, as I remember again from some years ago, looking at this, the people around the nuclear power plant tended to be in favor of it. Uh, you know, the jobs. Uh, you know, it, it's very. Uh, these things really can be made very safe. Certainly, the SEM are, are super uh, are super safe. But I think it's integrating the the uh, how you feel about climate, how serious you are about climate, and uh, there these are not risk free entirely. But nothing is risk free. So I think that's a again that's a leadership 
that's a leadership issue. Okay, uh, that's great. And um, would you, what would you recommend the involved parties? So the NR, as you were talking about, um, how would you recommend that um, those involved parties address the fears of the public? Because of course, anything nuclear related, there is going to be a, a new, this knee jerk reaction of fear toward mm -hmm. anything nuclear. So what would you recommend to them how to address those? Uh, I think, you know, getting the story out, uh, again, 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 my, this isn't the only strategy, but what I tried to, again, try to use things that we feel comfortable that we really can, uh, can use. Uh, again, I would, uh, uh, I think we've got a number of organizations, uh, uh, systems that are really working very well. It's a real question of doing it together. Uh, they all show up in the Department of Energy. Uh, hmm, that's an opportunity for the for the Energy Department. I, you notice I left 10 years before this thing really started. So that's part of the, if you will, it's not going to, this is not something you can do tomorrow. Uh, but I think you can, uh, uh, and it's not going to be easy. But I think if you look at the alternatives, it, it fits, uh, if you will, I would think it would fit. Uh, it, it, and it's part of telling the truth. You know, I mean, not pretending this is going to be easy or it's certainly not going to be cheap. Uh, but um, uh, this is what you need for, a, you know, an important job. I mean, that's kind of the reason I went back to the if you will, the arsenal of democracy approach. Uh, it's a big deal problem and it requires a big deal answer and, it, and it's something that needs to be time. It's a, a time urgent answer. Great. Um, and the last question we're gonna ask and we'll, like I said, turn it over to the audience. And I know we do have some uh, questions popping up, but um, would the, NR need to expand its mission to undertake such a responsibility? Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I uh, and that's a, you know, that's one of the organizational problems. And the part of the reason that naval reactors, I think, have been so successful is that they've not expanded their mission. Uh, they've kept to their knitting uh, very well. They are, it's a religion. All right. And what I'm suggesting is something that's, you know, apostate. I mean, it's, uh, so that would be a, a major challenge uh, to, to have them expand. But when I look around, I said it will require a significant uh, uh, organization that works all the way from uh, the research to the, to, you know, to putting this stuff away. And uh, I also think, frankly, uh, from a public perspective, uh, you can have confidence. I mean, they're, that they will do it right. And that religion of safety that they have and is, I think, is transferable uh, to the, if you will, to the public sector and, and frankly, I mean, uh, to the civilian sector. And it really is. Uh, if you go to these, uh, if you go to these uh, power plants now, uh, you know, you'll see all sorts of, of people who work in naval reactors uh, participating in what they're doing. And they also have a, a, you know, a very strong uh, safety culture. Perfect. Well, thank you for, for answering those questions. And we're going to open it up to the, we're going to open it up to the audience in one second. Okay. So, the first question, if successful, this will make a dent in climate change for the USA, but not the world. Now, what would you see happening post-2050? Yeah, I, I would think, uh, uh, again, that, that uh, uh, other countries are thinking about, obviously, you know, small molecular reactors as well. Uh, uh, but I think that this now becomes part of, if you will, uh, the, there's no reason why they can't uh, work on this, if you will, basically work on this as well. I think the, the, the uh, in, I mean, in, in some ways this gets back to the uh, strategy that was put together 
by nuclear energy that I mentioned earlier, where they're discussing a world, if you will, a competition in nuclear. I think this would put the U.S. ahead, but then it's an international problem and the opportunity for the U.S. to sell, if you will, and to cooperate and work with the rest of the world is there. We're, we're not talking about something you can do overnight by any means. Uh, and there are some extraordinarily uh, interesting or certainly difficult diplomatic problems in how you do that. But if we're not in the game, if we're not leaders in the game, we have no opportunity to influence what they're, what they're doing. Uh, but that's, a, you know, that's another talk. <laughs> Well, thank you uh, for that. And um, as a follow-up question, uh, Russia and China are major nuclear competitors. Right. Now, how do you see them reacting to the U.S. in this strategy? You had mentioned us becoming leaders. Uh, what does the competition look like in terms of actually yeah. enacting this? Well, they're both, you know, they both are really there. Again, uh, uh, how do you compete with them? Uh, this is uh, a national, there's no question that this is a national security issue. Uh, I point out that we work with, uh, uh, with Russia and China on the uh, JCPOA, the joint, uh, you know, the, the looking at the, the proliferation issues with Iran. Uh, you know, it's a tough issue. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think it's more than just uh, financial or commercial competition. It's also at the sort of soft power national security competition. So how do you work with, if you will, not just competitors, but potential adversaries in doing this? Uh, it's a tough, again, it's a, it's a tough problem. Uh, but if the U.S. doesn't stay ahead of the game, if we're not a leader, uh, I think the opportunity to do that is uh, just doesn't exist. Thank you, Dr. Reese. We also have this question. A uh, hundred years from now, how much waste is in the dry cast storage? And what uh, do we eventually do with that waste? Yeah, uh, uh, eventually, if it, there's a couple things you can do with it. One, if you add up how much it is, even a couple hundred years, it ain't that much. All right, I mean, it's really very, very large. Uh, I think, on the other hand, uh, uh, we've already demonstrated for, for a lot of waste that the uh, waste isolation uh, pilot plant in, in uh, which buries, uh, which buries the, uh, this case, the defense waste, but you could use that as well uh, for civilian waste. Uh, eventually, if at some stage, you might want to think about uh, reprocessing for another class of, another class of fast, uh, of, uh, you know, reactors where the, re the waste goes down. I, I just, uh, the reason I chose the using the dry cast storage is that the, the essence of the strategy I'm talking about is the problem is not 100 years from now, it's now. Uh, and the answer is a lot fast. And then, you, you know, you, we, we don't want to have to end up with 40 years in the courts. Uh, we want to be able to do something that's already uh, being uh, used all around the country, uh, it's got you know it's already licensed, it's already safe, and in many cases you have public uh, public acceptance. So I would just suggest that there are plenty of, pardon me, uh, uh, quite reasonable long-term geological storage uh, available, uh, especially if you start thinking a hundred years, and I think that's the right about the right number. Thank you, Dr. Reese. The next question um, is regarding energy storage as part of the grid solutions. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the following capability of SMRs helps a lot, but is there still a need for innovation in energy storage for the grid itself? Well, uh, you know, uh, again, I'm, you know, I'm certainly not an expert. I've just uh, done some reading on this. 
uh, you know, right now, the to, to do significant energy storage uh, for solar or for wind, uh, it's really a It's at the scale you're talking about. Uh, it's an R and D program. Yeah, there's some great R and D programs, uh, and I certainly would encourage everybody, you know, or if anybody asks, uh, uh, to you know. Uh, to work on these, but you can't, you know, but right now the standard battery uh, don't last long enough uh, and they're very expensive. Um, time will, you know, time will change, of course, on that. But again, I, I think the, uh, if you think climate change is a serious problem now, is gonna get more serious, you've gotta go with what you've got. And storage don't, doesn't quite fit the, um, significant storage doesn't solve the problem. The same thing would be true, I would argue, with things like carbon capture and sequestration and, you know, that sort of thing. And, you know, there's some also some very, very interesting uh, new types of micro reactors and other, other types of systems, which also will certainly play, should, if we do the right kind of investment, uh, you know, play a role over uh, over in, in the longer term. Thank you, Dr. Reese. And we also have this question. So the new skill design does not have pumps, but it does have water. And as uh, Ian Malcolm once said in Jurassic Park, nature uh, finds a way. What happens if for some reason water is lost? What happens then? Uh, the, it, it, the, the, the system, the new scale, again, I would refer you back to the, you know, the new scale. It's a very good website on how to do that. It captures, it keeps its own water uh, quite a bit, okay? And they've done a lot of analysis on, uh, and it, uh, uh, it's got enough water uh, within the modules themselves to be able to, uh, uh, you know, if there's, if there's any, uh, loss of power or anything like that to to uh, self cool over you know over burst you know over a month until it's finally air cooled. Uh, uh, again, I'm you know I would refer you to the you know to the web you know to the new scale website or you know talk to them uh, about it. But they have certainly considered considered. You know, considered they've worried about uh, earthquakes and EMP and all those other, all those wonderful things that might happen. Right. Uh, the, the, if I could pick up, I don't know if you're going to ask that, but the thing that, that uh, I thought was, um, that, that I discovered that I was not aware of very much is the, uh, the whole resilience of the grid, how serious a problem that is. Uh, and and I, I think that uh, SMRs, uh, in particular, the new scale way of using SMRs, if you have a lot of it, that could really help the resilience of the grid for blackouts, uh, all in the other, other, other situations. I think that's a problem that, uh, that we're facing. Uh, and uh, this would keep the current grid uh, available uh, for again, uh, maybe a lot, a lot longer as we think about more uh, um, different ways of different ways of, of working with it. Again, particularly if you're thinking about a lot of wind and solar and how all the stability of that all plays. I don't know what the answers are. I'm saying, however, that uh, that's something I think we can answer. And it's an important problem that uh, uh, it may not be the, the quite the climate change issue, but as you're solving solving the climate change issue, you you're going to need the grid to be operating effectively and safely as well. Thank you very much. I think we'll do one more question, and we'll okay. uh, we'll transition into talking about. Um, our upcoming um, webinar on October 8th. Um, now, what role, if any, might a new large reactors like the AP1000 play in your strategy? Yeah, I would, uh, as, uh, the, the, if, um, 
certainly I would, if, if they can be integrated into the system, uh, by all means. Uh, the problem is, uh, uh, you know, the, I mean, the AP-1000 uh, is best I can tell is a you know, terrific reactor. Uh, you know, the, the GE one as well. Um, but they're, they're, they're different. Okay. And in my perspective, you're going to need a lot of reactors. So any, if they can continue to operate, I think one, well, as I say, they'll continue operating the current reactors. Uh, but the issue from a climate change perspective is you need a lot fast. Okay, uh, if people uh, want to invest in the AP-1000, that's great. Uh, but I didn't want to get into the AP-1000, you know, I mean, I just don't know enough about whether you can build them at the rate I think you need to build them. Uh, they certainly can, they have a lot of, again, they're, you know, no carbon, so that's, that's good. But I was just looking at the with the SMR the play. Thank you. And okay. we actually have a, a, a one more um because I think this is a great way to end it. So um this person is asking, are you aware of any organizations, companies, government agencies that are friendly towards internships for college undergraduate students? I thought it was a, a great question to end on. Yeah. Uh you know, the I don't. And, and uh I do know that uh, is, I mean, DOE is pushing pretty hard on that. Uh, one of the parts of their strategy, which is, uh, you know, I, I applaud entirely, is in fact to get, uh, you know, to keep, uh, you know, invest a lot in colleges and universities. Uh, an internship is an interesting issue. I mean, I, I, uh, I didn't discuss uh, where you're going to get all those people, uh, you know, basically to do all this. But, I, you know, again, I'm not in the commercial nuclear business. I'm in the PowerPoint thinking business. Thank that's, you. A good, that's a good question. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Reese, again, for a wonderful talk, um, for really making a strong case, I think, for using these SMRs to really help with climate change. And I think you really laid out, a, like I said, a strong case. Now, for those of you who are interested, on October 8th, which is also a Thursday at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific and 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, we're going to have Reba Wisner um, as part of our webinar series. Uh, her presentations on hearing bomb testing on early Cold War television. So um, she is the author of three books, uh, Dimension of Sound, Music in the Twilight Zone. We Will Control All That You Hear, The Outer Limits in Oral, uh, oral uh, Imagination, and Music and the Atomic Bomb on American Television, uh, 1950 to 1969. So she is the current assistant professor of musicology at Columbia State University. So we're really excited to have her speaking about something that we don't always get a chance to have in our distinguished lecture series. So we hope you all attend. Uh, we'll have more information on our website as we did with Dr. Reese's presentation. So thank you all again for attending. Dr. Reese, thank you for a wonderful talk. And we hope you all have a safe and wonderful evening. Okay, thank you. So let me look at chat. Okay. You done? Yeah. And how did that go? No, I think it went okay. Uh, you know, it's hard to.